Very nice to meet you again. My name is Chris Carrillo, uh, manager within Deloitte um, in our infrastructure and financial advisory practice. Um, we're infrastructure class agnostic, but like uh, maybe some of you have heard earlier, um, personally I focus um, primarily in the water and resilience space, so very happy to be a, um, a part of this panel. Um, today we're going to be talking about, obviously I think an issue very close to home for many Texans, um, definitely resilience planning um, and, and adaptation to a number of uh, different resilience events. So uh, enough about me, we'll go ahead and ask my, uh, the panelists to go ahead and introduce themselves. Uh, I guess Greg, if you want to start and give a quick introduction. Sure, I am Carol Haddix, digital twin. Uh, she could not make it today, uh, so you got me. So I'm Greg Eyerly, I'm the director of Houston Water. Fantastic, all right, and Mark? Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mark Cruder. I work for the City of Austin Office of Resilience, looking at climate impacts to our assets and operations, but also climate impacts to our community members. Fantastic. Thank you both. And so um, just to help set the stage for our conversation, um, just some statistics that I'm sure folks in the resilience sector, <clears throat> just it's not very, it's not unfamiliar. But in 2023, I just pulled this information from the National Center for Environmental Information from NOAA. Um, 2023, 28 separate disaster events across the country that resulted in over a billion dollars of losses. So uh, total CPI adjusted costs of those events, $93 billion. Um, so that's just, that's at a national level. So I think um, the conversation I'd like to have today will be um, obviously Texas is a tough state. Um, we're not unfamiliar with dealing with these challenges. And so I think that's a good way to set the stage to go ahead and jump right into our conversation. So first question I'll ask our panelists uh, to start, maybe what kind of innovative approaches do you find that your organizations are taking to, um, uh, to adapt to um, climate related uh, weather events? Ad adaptation or mitigation? So I guess I can, Mark, if you'd like to start. Yeah, sure. Um, so innovation, you know, necessity is a mother of invention. Um, we need to be thinking about new things all the time, but there is a tendency to use existing data and past events as a means to determine what's going to happen in the future. And I need, think we need to rethink that. We can no longer sort of accept all these unprecedented events as being, oh, it's just happened once, it'll never happen again. These things are happening more and more, and they're impacting all our sectors. So we have to rethink how do we collect that data, what is that data, how do we ground truth that data. One of the things we're starting to do is trying to figure out how to incorporate the University of Texas throughout our processes. Now, faculty are wonderful. They create a lot of tools, but these tools are not always useful for us because they're not really placed in our hands at the right time, the right place for something that we need to solve at that moment. So innovation means like bringing these two groups together, making sure they're talking the same language, and figuring out how can we tie data to decision making because we make decisions all day long for things that might have impact for us for the next 20 years, 30 years, or 50 years. So how do we bring that data down to our scale in a way we can use it right now to ensure that decisions we're making today are not gonna come back and haunt us 20 or 30 years from now? And for this weather, it's just so crazy, it's impossible to anticipate what's gonna happen. We never thought we'd be hit by a cold spell, snow and ice a couple years ago. And now we're trying to figure out how do we prepare, how do we get salt trucks and plows and you know, make sure we weatherize our systems. We are both panicking, but also really sort of getting down to the ground and sort of working together and trying to figure out how to tie all this together. So for me, it's gotta be data, it's gotta be understanding what we need and making sure they're making the right decisions. Thank you, Mark. Greg, innovative approaches? Yeah, I think you need to set the stage a little bit about Houston's a little, quite a bit different than, than Austin, even though we're in the same state. Uh, you know, you come into Austin's skyline, you see cranes over the top of buildings as Austin is, you know, struggling under growth and expansion. And, you know, in Houston, uh, we are having increasing vacancies in our downtown area. Uh, some of our re really nice places uh, have uh, occupancy rates uh, dropping to as low as 10% in some of our buildings uh, as a result. Uh, so we're, we're facing a little different challenge. We're a much older city. Uh, also, we're kind of at the crossroads of uh, where we're impacted by hurricanes uh, in three ways. Uh, we're impacted by hurricanes through winds, uh, storm surge, and heavy rainfall, as we found out in, in Harvey. Um, we also were hit with an EF3 tornado last year. Uh, one of our treatment plants took a direct hit from a tornado. Uh, we also were hit with uh, the same Arctic blast, Yuri, but, you know, in the last two years in a row, we've had 
Arctic uh, impacts in Houston. Um, and we also have um, the whole petrochemical uh, industry down there. Uh, we have uh, multiple points uh, within our watershed and even within our own lake that we uh, reserve for our water capacity that has train tracks growing across it and pipelines underneath it. So uh, we have a lot of challenges. And so how, how are we facing those challenges? Uh, the, simp the simple way is not, in it, is, is not necessarily innovative. It's, it's really going out and, and replacing the infrastructure that we have that's, that's really aged, and how, how do we do that? Uh, the second is, uh, I introduced myself as digital twin, but uh, we are pushing uh, AI uh, very aggressively in Houston water, both on the water and wastewater side. And uh, we're doing that on the wastewater side to stay in compliance with our consent decree. And how we use that is uh, we use AI to score uh, our sewer segments as we go in and inspect them. And that drives our rehabilitation program for sanitary sewer. And just to give you an example, uh, to watch uh, one segment of sewer line for a person, um, first of all, is mind-numbing. Uh, but second, to, to think about doing that all day and you close your eyes at night and what do you think about is sewer segments. But anyway, <laughs> for a person to watch and score a sewer segment, it's about 15 minutes. And for AI, it's about five seconds. And, uh, and we've been able to save, we've calculated already, we've saved 30,000 staff hours in the last uh, two years using AI. Uh, it's also more consistent scoring. Um, but it can also be wrong. Um, and, and so uh, I call it our, our artificial stupidity. And, uh, and so we have to correct for that. And really the whole industry, I wanna say, is benefiting from the work we're doing in Houston because we're putting so many inputs uh, that when other people go to use uh, AI for sewer scoring, uh, they'll benefit from the work we're doing in Houston. Um, so we're using that as a means to help uh, adapt and be in compliance with our consent decree. Um, and then on the water side, uh, we're using modeling and, and digital twin uh, for leak detection and uh, predictive uh, maintenance uh, and how we're gonna go about rehabilitating uh, our very old distribution system. And so, uh, as I came here today, we had nearly 1,800 active uh, water leaks in the city of Houston. So we're trying to get that down. Well, thank you both. It definitely sounds like between the both, uh, both answers, the, the combination of data um, is, is coming to a, a way to kind of replace aging infrastructure and, and, and support your respective cities. So thank you for that. Um, so moving on, uh, next question I have is, um, I guess, yeah, if you're able to expand a little bit more about some of the challenges you, you experience um, uh, with respect to um, various parts of the resilience project life cycle. So whether that's, a, do you find challenges in planning? Is it with respect to funding? Is it um, implementing the projects? What do you find is the most uh, challenging part? Yes. Okay. okay. All of the above. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, as you said, Houston is an older city. We're a younger, maybe more attractive city. Uh, we, <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we grow at about 155 people a day. So in the time you got here this morning, I think 20 U-Haul trucks just pulled up and we're just growing really, really fast. Um, but that also puts a lot of challenges as our infrastructure is building and as we're trying to sort of build out, there's a lot of uncertainty about how do we start to build out going forward. You know, we live in a, in a fire adaptive ecosystem, so we have wildfires. While we have very few big wildfires in the West Austin, we have daily grass fires in East Austin. We have elastic soils. We have heat. Well, I know we live in the South, so we're used to heat. But last year, we had 80 days over 100, 40 of those days over 105. I mean, that's full on Phoenix weather right there. So these things are just, we're at flash floods. These things are happening. So the challenge is, is like, how do we start to like put this together? And one thing we started to realize internally is that we can no longer work as a silo. I think it really became painfully aware within our systems that we are so dependent on each other. Everybody's dependent on water. Everybody's dependent on power. Everybody's dependent on roads. 
but these things are networks and they're super vulnerable, especially in places with that flood, places with elastic soil and other sort of stressors. So we have to be working together. And we started to do that internally. We started to figure out like, what are those weak links and how do we build them up together? The minute we start to just silo ourselves and do it separately, we end up just getting in trouble. The other thing though, and this is something that's more recent, there are political ramifications to climate impacts. Whenever you have a big event, politics get involved. Our city manager got canned a year ago. This is starting to like have reper like impacts on staff, on leadership, our decision-making process throughout. And this is not just Austin, this is everywhere it's happening. So that uncertainty in political systems, our uncertainty in sort of weather impacts has sort of challenged us to really dig deep and work together to get past that. And then the second piece of that is the people who are hit by these events are typically people with the least amount of resources. They're typically first hit and worst hit. So most of the flood water in Austin goes east. Most of the people who live with the least amount of resources are on the east side. Most of the grass fires, east side. Most of the heat impacts with her, Rinne Heat Island, east side. So how do we as a city start to really sort of take ownership of that and making sure that those impacts are not felt by the brunt of the people with the least amount of resources? So thinking about those vulnerable populations throughout our processes. Thank you, um, Greg. Anything to add from Earth Respective Challenges? Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, obviously there's politics and everything. And uh, Houston, uh, I think Texas is attractive. You know, I think four of the ten, top 10 uh, cities uh, population wise are, are here in Texas. And, uh, and so uh, he's right about U-Hauls. Uh, the price of a U-Haul is based on the popularity of where you're moving to. And two years ago when we moved to Texas, uh, the price of a U-Haul was seven, this first small one was like $7,000 to go from Oregon to Texas. Now, if I took that same U-Haul and just flipped it around and said I was going from Texas to Oregon, that same U-Haul was only $3,000. So that tells you, so that's how U-Haul manages where their, their, their trucks and, are going. They're going by what, what's desirable. And Texas is desirable. And so, you know, pick your choice. I think there's a Jack, what's his name? Jack Black. There's a movie out there that talks about five different countries of, of, of Texas. And that's, that's kind of true. There's four major different cities, and they all have remarkably different uh, flavors to them and, and a feel. And, and so uh, in, in Houston, you know, politically, uh, we have a challenge, but we have an advantage uh, if we get our act together. And that is, uh, Houston is a jelly donut. And if we just act like a jelly donut, we can come together in Houston and be very, very powerful. Uh, what I mean by that is, in the core of Houston, it's democratic. Uh, that's our jelly. Uh, on the outside of Houston, it's very Republican. And that's our donut. Um, and... You know, if you just have jelly working, it's just jelly. And it's, jelly can't do a whole lot. And a donut is okay, but it's not as good as a jelly donut. Yeah. So <laughs> if Houston can come together uh, in a bipartisan way uh, and uh, operate at the state level and even, frankly, at the federal level, um, we can do amazing things politically. And uh, you know, I, we were speaking out in the lobby. And um, with respect to water, you know, Deloitte talked about how fragmented water is. There's, there's 45,000, they think, they're not sure, there's 45,000 water utilities in the United States, and there's approximately 15,000 wastewater utilities. Power, there's about 2,500 nationwide. And, and so if we can bring ourselves together and act in a way, uh, both at the state and the federal level in Houston, we can we can address a lot of our infrastructure challenges and a lot of our resiliency challenges that are in front of us. Oh, I forgot to say, we also have saltwater intrusion uh, at, what, at one of our water supply uh, on the Tr Trinity River, I think. Uh, so um, that, is our, that is our opportunity, is to come together politically and, um, and address some of these issues. I will say this about Houston is uh, if Houston has, if Houston has a problem, which we've all heard, you know, it's a, it's a famous saying, uh, Houston, we have a problem. That is not just a problem for Texas. Uh, that is a national impact. Um, 
with our shipping, uh, our petroleum industry, uh, if Houston has a problem, a real problem, a Jackson, Mississippi type of problem, um, that impact will be felt nationwide. And so we realize that and we are planning ahead. I really feel like we have some internal momentum and some mechanisms to work with the rest of the donut and come together to make a real impact. Well, fantastic. And I think that's definitely a, a trend, at least from uh, seeing that, yes, the 43,000 water utilities across the country, how they can work together to be able to um, um, solve some of these challenges. And I think that's actually a perfect segue um, to the next question, I think would be focused on um, what would you say, what, what way are, um, are you involving communities and in, in your roles in, um, in planning some of these projects? And what ways are you bringing in um, you know, the general public and, and involving others? Um, I think some of it is voluntary and some of it's not, right? So we at the Office of Resilience and the Office of Sustainability sort of took a proactive approach to talk to community first. Um, after doing a couple of years of working with utilities and asset managers, of going through this, you know, really deductive vulnerability assessment of, you know, what are critical assets, what are the thresholds for vulnerability, et cetera, we felt we're pretty confident that we knew what resilience was. And the first thing we did is we were like, well, you know, we should probably talk to the community. And we went to the community and we're like, hey, we're here to talk about resilience. And they're like, you seem like a really nice guy, but why are you talking to us about resilience? Because we've lived through these floods. We lived through these events. So we quickly realized we have to like really rethink how we approach the community discussion and figure out what's the best way to connect. And one of the things we learned is, you know, we were focused on deficit-based thinking. We were focused on how do we help the community without really listening to the community. And when we started to listen to the community, we realized there was a lot of great things happening in the community. They were already being resilient. They already had these systems there. We needed to sort of shift that conversation and see how do we bolster what's good in the community and seeing how we can use that in order to make better decisions within our own systems. Now, for example, you know, we, we were focused on heat. There's a place in Austin, east, north of here, Runberg, that has very little tree canopy, a lot of impervious cover, freeways, uh, parking lots. People there are living with heat. They have homes without insulation. They have to take the bus without bus shelters. And we went out there, we're like, we're gonna come out here, talk to you guys, plant some trees, get some bus shelters. And, and most of the people are like, you know, we are impacted by heat at home. Our work, our spouse come home from working outside in construction or landscaping, they have headaches, they're nauseous, they're not responding. Our kids don't wanna go outside because it's too hot, so they stay indoors on tablets. At night, they're not sleeping because it gets, doesn't get below 80, so they're not sleeping well, so if they have mental health issues. And all of a sudden, we're like, why are we so focused on trees? I mean, those things take like 10 years to grow. We should be focusing on weatherization. We should be focusing on making sure that energy doesn't cost too much for these folks. We should be focusing on water. Like, how do we make sure that we're helping people where they need it, when they need it, so that we're making the right decisions and not assuming we know what the best thing is? Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. Greg, anything else to add? Um, we, so I have to say, I, I do believe Austin is ahead of Houston. Uh, when it comes to both community engagement and, and planning for resiliency and sustainable infrastructure, we are, we are just embarking on some of those. Um, I'm really trying to save my material for the next panel, which I'm on as well. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, we, we, we do have some initiatives coming ahead that we will be able to bring uh, our community together. Um, you know, obviously we've had the national championships for college football and the final four for basketball. I don't, I don't think Austin's had any of that um, in the last couple of years. So we've had lots of focus uh, on uh, lots of opportunities to share more about Houston. And we have the Houston Rodeo going on as well, um, world's largest rodeo, um, which actually was my first rodeo. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, I'll talk about a little more. N next session is teaser right there Thank about you. how yep. we're going to engage the community upcoming. Perfect. Keep the people you know, around yeah, for the next. Right. Yes, yes, I'll exactly. be here all week. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, perfect. Well, then um, moving on and hopefully uh, not breaking into the, the next panel um, discussion, I guess I feel like a standard, maybe a, hopefully an easy question, but we'll see. Um, if you had a magic wand, of course, if there was a particular resilience-focused project or program that you would, you know, could implement and it's 
completed by tomorrow, is there one that comes to mind? Wow. If I had, um, if I had a magic wand, I'd probably first be filthy rich. <laughs> a little bit taller, a little bit better looking. Oh, world peace. But great things. I mean, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, if if I had a magic wand, it would be in as dumb as as simple as this is better coordination. We have so much brain power. We have so much ability within our city. We're growing, so we have a lot of opportunity to do the right thing. It's just coordination is so difficult, and I I know that sounds simple, but it's so important because. If we're not coordinating well together, we're actually competing against each other, competing against each other for grant money, for projects, for time, for space within the right of way. I mean, the list goes on. And yeah, I mean, if, if we should all just get along, I mean, as dumb as that sounds, I think that's probably the most important. And world peace. Thank you. Nope, of course, world peace. And then. <laughs> Oh, Greg, flexibility. I mean, we we know flexibility in funding. Uh, we know there's a finite amount of funds. You know, we can borrow money. Uh, even flexibility uh, in that would be helpful. Uh, we, on the wastewater side uh, in Houston, with our consent decree, uh, I cannot build projects fast enough to spend all the money that we have. Uh, waiting for us to spend with low interest, uh, and we're about ready to get penalties because I can't spend it fast enough. And on the water side, I do not have enough, not even close to enough money to go in and rehabilitate and replace the water lines that we have. Presently, we're getting between 40 and 70 new leaks a day in Houston. And I cannot keep up with that. Some of our pipe is really, really old, and uh, the majority of our pipe is at least 30 years old, if not 40. Um, and so this is the flexibility uh, of being able uh, to, sp sp even if it's a loan, being able to, if the inf infrastructure loan, some way to, to do some form of approval to get be able to funnel that money elsewhere it would be helpful. It, it's it's almost like you know you can't make your mortgage payment, but you have all the money you need to spend on your car payment and more than you even need to spend on your uh, car payment, and you're about ready to get kicked out of the house. And frankly, if there if there is no water then all our wastewater problems have gone away in Houston. I really don't have to worry about the consent decree anymore. So uh, that's, that's the issue. So if I could make, wave a magic wand is once we get all those fundies in place and we get, <clears throat> you, know, you know, it takes years to get that in place, and then if we get into kind of the implementation phase and it's like, mm, you know, we really need it over here, that there's some mechanism to do that. Okay. No, thanks for sharing. I really appreciate that. Um, well, great. Well, then maybe, um, I know we're coming up close here on time. Um, without teasing too much, of course, to the next panel, um, if there's any future projects or strategies you're most excited about for City of Austin or, or City of Houston. Um, Mark, not sure if you'd like to start. So I'm not on the next panel, so I can just tell you whatever, yeah. whatever I want. Um, <laughs> I guess the, what I'm most excited about, and that wasn't a I, mean, I, wasn't, I wasn't criticizing. Um, what I'm most excited about is we have recently created the UT City Climate Collab, so it's a relationship between the city of Austin and the University of Texas, and that um, we have a you know a handful of professors on our on the CUT side, a handful of staff on our side for the chief sustainability officer, myself, and a couple more people. And what we do is we try to work with departments, our energy company, our water company, our roads and bridges, you know, asset managers seeing at what threshold in the past their assets were impacted by climate change, be it a flood, a heat wave, uh, elastic soils, et cetera. What is that threshold? And then work with, with uh, faculty to see what are the projections on that threshold going forward. So it's almost like tailor making and tailor fitting data and projections to the actual decision making we're making on the ground. I mean, this is not a, a simple like, hey, just tell me your thresholds will go forward. Like we have to look at a lot of different pipes, a lot of different, uh, assets, substations, uh, rec centers, and sort of working through every single one of those and then trying to figure out how to connect the data to the decision making. Uh, so yeah, UT, City, Climate Collab, 
I think we have a website now. Fantastic. Greg? High speed rail. Okay. <laughs> to, to Austin? <laughs> no. Uh, I would say uh, is one water, uh, you know, bringing all of our communities around Houston together in one effort uh, around water. Fantastic. Um, well, thank you both for that. Um, yep, the Climate Collab definitely sounds like a very interesting um, initiative that um, Mark for, for leading that um, definitely sounds like a um, fantastic benefit to the, to the, the broader community. Um, so here, uh, just one more question here I've got, um, because if there's any lessons learned that you'd like to share with other municipal or state leaders here uh, attending today, just from your experience um, in implementing uh, resilience, resilient projects. Uh, Greg, I'm not sure if you'd like to start. Uh, no, you can go. <laughs> okay. Uh, I guess there's two, but the same theme is, I kind of said this before, like we always think of ourselves as an island, but there are hundreds, hundreds of cities out there doing the exact same thing at the exact same time, dealing with the exact same issues. We talk to cities all the time to be like, what do you guys do here? What do you guys do there? How do you guys deal with fly, fire, floods, et cetera? But we also started to talk about to cities internationally because they're dealing with something completely different or have completely different ways of thinking about things. So that's one piece of it is like, you know, you have people on the outside who are doing the same thing, but then also we have indigenous and local culture and local knowledge that have a long history of dealing with these same issues. How do we draw from that also? Because there's some lessons there that we should definitely draw into our asset and operations management. So not, we're not constantly making the same mistakes over and over again. I think Texas learned a lesson uh, with winter storm Uri and not, not seeing um, the potential downfall of being as dependent as Texas was on wind energy. And during winter storm Uri, and one of the reasons um, there were greater impacts is, you know, power grid, you know, failed. And a, a portion of that failure was that the wind speeds were very low during that cold snap. And the amount of wind power generating to the grid was not adequate. And the latest uh, winter storm we had back in mid-January, Texas-wide, the, the wind speeds were up quite a bit higher and the, and the grid held a lot better. Um, so I think not seeing potentially uh, that as a potential, it, it's, it's always something you haven't thought about. And how do you think about what you're not thinking about? It? And I haven't figured that out either. So, um, because I'm not thinking about it. Uh, but, but anyway, I think Texas learned that, uh, that um, we, we were asked two weeks ago, we had a national conference here for water um, here in Austin, and both uh, San Antonio Water and Houston Water, we were putting in you know, diesel and natural gas generators, and we were challenged on, you know, for backup generation, and, and we were challenged on why we were not you know, taking a greener approach to that, and it's because of URI, we learned that we just needed to stick with the, the, the basics of what we could get to our facilities to, to, maintain, our, to maintain them, and, and so we didn't want to be dependent again on the grid. Excellent. No, and uh, I, think, I think it's a great way to kind of wrap up the conversation and that, yep, it, there's still many challenges in dealing with many of these uncertainties, and so... The approaches that we're, we're developing are, um, yep, still, still works in progress, but obviously lots of progress made by City of Houston, Houston Water as well. So um, that's our time. Thank you to InfraDay again for, um, for a wonderful event, and it's very nice to uh, speak with you all today. Thank you. Thank you.